You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Why are you delaying God? And what we're really saying to the Lord is this, do you really love me? That's what we're saying. God, do you really love me? If you love me, you would do it now. But let me give you a verse. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 8. It says this, Therefore, the Lord will wait that he might be gracious to you. <laughs> gracious? God's being gracious? Yeah, because see, God's working on us. He wants to build up our faith. He wants to build up our trust. Have you ever asked someone a question and they either didn't answer or took a long time to acknowledge you? If you have children, you may be all too familiar with that situation. What about when you ask God a question? Do you ever feel like you've been waiting forever with no answer? Well, today Pastor Ron explains that God is gracious by giving you time to develop your faith and trust through waiting. You have to learn to be patient, and that's done through trust. You have to trust God and wait on Him. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 11 as he continues his message, The Truth About Death. Lazarus is sick here. It has nothing to do with sin. We're actually told that his sickness and even his death is going to be used for God's glory. But you know what? We've already seen this earlier on in the book of John. We saw it in John chapter 9 when Jesus and his disciples were walking out of the temple. They saw a man there. They, everybody knew him because if you grow up in that, everybody knows who he is. That's the guy that was born blind. He's been here for years. Same old place, begging. And the disciples had this mentality, and they said to Jesus, Lord, just got to ask you a question. You know all things. Who sinned? Was it his mom and dad that he was born blind, or, or is it his sin? And Jesus said, it's neither. Neither of them sin, but that God might receive glory. And then it says this something wonderful. Of course, the Lord touched him, and his eyes were open, and he could see. And we say, oh, wow, praise the Lord, man. God used that for his glory. But listen, more often than not, God will choose not to heal for his glory. How about that? What? Yeah. We, we have examples of it in the scriptures. How about the apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul, we are told, he said he had a thorn in the flesh. It was a physical infirmity that was slowing him and hurting him. And, and he's, it says he asked the Lord three times, Lord, would you remove this from my life? After all, I'm traveling around the country. I'm traveling continents to share the gospel. I'm starting churches in places. And Lord, it would be nice if you take this away. I could be more effective. And the Lord said, no, I'm not going to take that out of your life. And you know what? Paul submitted to that. We're, we're told that he never, he didn't ever ask that again. He said, Lord, that's fine. Your strength is made perfect in my weakness. So praise the Lord. And there's so many examples. How about Johnny Erickson Tata? I remember, I, and I think she's a little bit older than myself, but I remember when it happened, I, I was young, and uh, she was going to, I think the, she was training to be an Olympic diver, and uh, she was jumping off just a platform in a lake. She dumped off, 16 years old, hit the bottom, and was instantly paralyzed from the neck down. And she's been like that for 50 years. I've had the opportunity to meet her, to hear her speak on many occasions. Wow, it's so powerful. And she has traveled the world over so many times, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many have been saved, many encouraged in their faith. That's not wasted, ladies and gentlemen. God has done that and allowed that for his glory, and she would tell you that. We must never think that love and suffering are incompatible because we're not. Even in this story, we see that God uses it as part of his plan. Warren Wiersbe had some great words. He says, it is not important that we as Christians be comfortable. Now, I'm going to stop right there in his quote because, listen, you make that quote 30, 40 years ago, everybody gets that right on, but not today because we think it's all about being comfortable, don't we? What we think of, this is why I want to encourage you to go on a mission trip, go on a short-term mission trip. I mean, do that. Next summer, we, we had three this summer. We'll have three more next summer. If we could do more, we'd do more. Because listen, all you got to do is get out of this bubble for a week. Oh, not going to another country. Because there's lots of third world countries you can go to. And you could be, you could be isolated in a nice resort. But, that, but you go into where it's how people really live. And it opens your eyes, right? We, we like to be comfortable. But Warren Wears me. It's not important that we as Christians are comfortable. It's important that we glorify God in everything we do. I say amen to that. So when we find ourselves confronted with disease and disappointment, delays, or even death, we can find comfort. We can find encouragement knowing God is in control. And so Jesus says, this is going to happen for God to receive glory and the Son of God. That's speaking of himself. That's a, that's a declaration of deity. 
So let's move on. Now, Jesus, verse 5, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So we just have this little sentence. Now, that would go, remember, it, it, she said in the message, Lord, you know, the one you love. And then we have verse 5. It says, and, and Jesus did love Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, why insert that, that verse there? Very important. It's because of verse 6. So when Jesus heard that he, Lazarus, was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. So I just want you to know, humanly speaking, without verse 5, verse 6 makes no sense. Because verse 6 seems very unloving, very insensitive, and very uncaring. So Jesus hears his good friend is sick, and he stays two more days. Really? That doesn't sound very loving. That sounds very incongruent with the character of Jesus. But again, Jesus did love Lazarus. It tells us in verse 5 that he loved him with agape love, perfect love, divine love. So what's going on? Well, first of all, Jesus is on a divine timeline. He knew what he's doing. He knows that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. That's why he uses the word agape in verse 5, divine love. I'll tell you why. Because listen, if Jesus didn't have divine love, if it was only human love for Lazarus, I'll tell you what. Human love would have immediately done this. Lazarus is sick. Oh my gosh, come on guys, we better go. Let's get over there as soon as we can because we got to heal Lazarus. We got to do this. That's, that's human love, right? We'd all do that. Jesus got divine love, omnipotent love. What is omnipotent in a hurry, in, omnipotence in a hurry for? Omnipotence is in no hurry. Omnipotence, which just means almighty power. Almighty God, almighty power is an absolute no rush. So Jesus waits two more days. He's going to put his glory on display in an undeniable way. Why? Well, he wants to strengthen the disciples' faith. You see, in a few months from now, Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to die on the cross. And he wants to assure his disciples, listen, I got resurrection power. I've got power. So it's not callousness why Jesus waited. It was love. And listen, there are times in our life where God waits <laughs> more often than not, right? Too much. There are times where God puts us on hold, and we, we ask God, why are you waiting, God? Why are you taking so long? Why aren't you answering me? Why are you delaying, God? And what we're really saying to the Lord is this, do you really love me? That's what we're saying. God, do you really love me? If you love me, you would do it now. Well, let me give you a verse. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 8. It says this. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he might be gracious to you. <laughs> gracious? God's being gracious? Yeah, because see, God is working on us. He wants to build up our faith. He wants to build up our trust. I was reading a devotional. It just happened to be this morning I was reading my devotion. And, and just a one line popped out to me, you know, because we're so impatient, right? God wants to develop patience in us. The, the parent of patience is trust. The parent of patience is trust. Listen, when we're impatient, <laughs> we're not trusting God, right? <laughs> you don't care. You don't love me. We need to trust God. So many times God will be gracious. He'll wait. And he'll answer in his perfect time. God wants to bless us. He wants to work in life, but he knows what we need. He's in no rush in putting his glory in display. He wants us to see the full, the full glory. By the way, we already know that shortly after the messenger was dispatched, that was one day. It was two days Jesus delayed. When they will finally go, it'll take them a day to get there. So by the time they get there, it tells us Lazarus was dead four days. So by the time the messenger had first left, he probably died sometime right after that. Pretty radical. Of course, Jesus knew all that. Now, notice the response to the news. Jesus says, well, we're going to wait two days, you know. And he did. And then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. So so let's wait, then we're going to go, and now it's time to go. Jesus, again, knows the perfect timing. Again, he wants to make sure that, that understand this, when we talk about death of the Jews, the first four days are the days of greatest mourning. They, they don't eat, they fast, they don't change their clothes the first four days. And so at, at, by this time of four days, we know that the body is already beginning to deteriorate. It even says that when they get, we get later verses, don't open the tomb. He, he smells by now. It's beginning to rot. So Jesus wanted a way to make sure this was only the, the Lord. He wasn't in some kind of coma or anything. Perfect timing. 
But Jesus says, let's now go. Well, that leads us to the reaction of the disciples in verses 8 through 16. The disciples said, Rabbi, lately the Jews have sought to stone you, and you're going there again? Um, I don't don't really think we should go there, Lord. In in chapter 10 and verse 31, it tells us they tried to stone Jesus again. Three times they have tried to stone Jesus to death. So the disciples are thinking, I don't think we want to go there because, you know, first of all, you said Lazarus is just sick. Maybe he's getting better by now, right? Right? And and if we go there, you know, uh, they're trying to stone you, Jesus. What they're thinking about is themselves. You know that, right? They're thinking about themselves. Lord, you know, they're trying to kill you. Ah, We we don't really need to go back there. They're worried for themselves. And so Jesus answered it. He gives them an illustration in verses 9 and 10. He said, are there not 12 hours in a day? Now, he's using Roman Jewish time. They, They divided their day into half. Half daylight, half night. And then each of the day and of the night, they divide it into four watches. But it's a simple terminology. It's a generally 12 hours of light, generally 12 hours of darkness. Obviously, that changes a little bit according to the season. But he was saying, aren't there essentially 12 hours in the day, 12 hours of light? And of course, they were nodding their house. Yes. And Jesus gives them then a, a simple illustration of, of daylight and darkness. If anyone walks in, walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. If you're walking in the daylight, you don't need to worry. In other words, you don't worry if you're going to fall or stumble because it's daylight. You feel comfortable. It's okay. But if you walk in the night, you stumble because the light is not in you. So the contrast of walking in the day versus walking in the night, and what Jesus is trying to tell them is, look, it's daylight. I'm alive. I'm walking according to the perfect timetable of God. You're with me. Don't worry. You're not going to stumble. No one's going to take my life prematurely. You're worried that I'm going to be stoned. No, no, no. I've already told you before, I'm going to go to the cross, and it's much further than now. It's going to be at the Passover. No one's going to take my life from me early, and no one's going to take it too late. I'm going to lay it down on my own. And he's really trying to encourage them. He's trying to let them know, guys, you're worried that someone's going to take my life? Don't worry. We're walking in the day. You're walking with me. No one's going to take your life too soon, but neither is it going to last longer than God wants. And by the way, it's the same way with us. How important this is to understand. That listen, if you're walking with the Lord, if you're walking in the will of God, just serving the Lord, listen, your life is not going to be cut short, though there are things happening around us because we hear all these things happening, oh Lord, the economy, and now there's missiles going to strike off of Guam, and they're flying over. What's going to happen? Not fearful. Listen, I talked just yesterday to uh, Calvary Chapel in Guam. Some good friends that were part of our church at one time. Then they went over there and started the Calvary in Guam. And they've gotten posts. They got it several days ago, given to them, everybody on the island from the military. Get ready for the strike. It's happening Tuesday, if you didn't know that, you know. But guess what they're doing right now? They're having church. They're having church. And I go, oh, what are we going to do? Listen, you trust in God. Listen, when you walk in the will of God, you're not going to be taken out of this world any earlier than God wants you out. Now, on the other hand, you're not going to stay here any longer than God wants you out either. In other words, you can, be as, you can eat as healthy as you want, you can exercise as much as you want, but you're not going to live one day longer than God has planned for you. Now, I'm not saying eat bad and don't exercise. I try to eat healthy as best I can. I'm working on it and exercise so that my time here, it's already set, my time here can be, you know, used for the Lord. So I I can enjoy, I can have a quality of life to serve Jesus. So I don't want to affect that with all the other garbage that's out there. So I think we need to use wisdom. But listen, I'm not going to extend my life one second longer than Jesus has for me. But on the other hand, I'm not fearful. I'm not, oh, what's going to happen? I'm just trusting the Lord. That's what Jesus was saying to the disciples. Don't worry. You're walking in the light. You're trusting me. You don't need to worry about stumbling. Now, you walk in darkness, then you got to be concerned. That's the idea. Now, moving on, verse 11, he said, these things he said, and after that he said to him, listen, our friend Lazarus, he's sleeping, but I'm going to wake him up. Now, we're going to find out that actually Lazarus died, right? Jesus goes on to say that. But understand, the Bible uses the term sleep to describe the death of of a believer, of a child of God. Because for us, it's just a temporary repose. In fact, it's just a changing of address, really. This terminology was used of Stephen, the church's first martyr. Remember, he stood up for the Lord, and we read in Acts 7 and verse 16 that he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice as they began to throw stones at him. And he said this, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And when he said this, 
he fell asleep. It literally means he died. He died because for the child of God, that's what happens. You just, you go from one place to another, and, and for the believer, it's like sleep, right? Now, more accurate would be to say, um, you're alive in heaven, or you've changed address. So if you ever hear the paper say, hey, uh, Ron Hint, he was that pastor at Calvary Houston, he died. No, don't believe it. That's not true. I'm alive and well, okay? I'll be alive and well in heaven. I've shed my old earthly tent, and I'm now living in the Father's mansion. Amen? Amen. That's more of a, but, but it's just like sleep. It's like, go and wake up in the presence of the Lord. What we don't want to do with this passage is take what is called the doctrine of soul sleep. Now, it's not widely taught. It was at one time, but there are some that still adhere to it, which teaches that the soul remains in a literal sleep until the final resurrection at Christ's coming. That is not true. We know that because 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8 says this, to be absent from this body when we pass from this life is to be immediately present with the Lord. So, Jesus says to his disciples, our friend sleeps, but I go to wake him up. Then his disciples said, well, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. We don't need to go then. Let's stay here, man. It's safe. He's going to wake up. Maybe the fever will break. He's all right. Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. Jesus then said to him plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, imagine what they're thinking now. Oh, really? So, Lazarus is dead? Then, Jesus, why did we stay here for two days? Really? Why did we wait? We, we should have been going on. And then Jesus makes it worse, at least in our minds. He says in verse 15, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. What? That is, sounds heartless. Yeah, why? You, you're glad they weren't there? He died? I don't understand. Yes, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. See, Jesus has purposely delayed his departure, knowing full well that Lazarus will die. Why? because he wants to encourage the faith of his disciples like never before. As I said, a few months from now, Jesus is going to go to the cross, and he knows, he realizes the disciples are going to need a reservoir of faith to pull them through that difficult time. So Jesus says, no, he's died. Nevertheless, it is now time to go. Nevertheless, let's go. So the disciples have delayed. I don't want to go. Lazarus, why is he dead? Why do we need to go? There's persecution awaiting us. But Jesus says, no, we're going. And then look at the last verse we want to look at this morning. Then Thomas, who is called the twin. Some of your translations say Didymus. That, that means twin in Greek. So we do know that uh, he was a twin. So he had a, a counterpart. He had a brother or sister. We don't know if identical twin or paternal. We aren't told. Um, But we're familiar with Thomas, right? We learn of him a lot when Jesus rises from the dead, right? We call him Doubting Thomas, right? Uh, Jesus appears after his resurrection to all the disciples. Thomas didn't happen to be there. They tell Thomas, man, you missed out. The Lord rose from the dead. Ah, he says, I won't believe it until I put my hands in his side and in his hands, in the wounds. Sure enough, what does Jesus do? Jesus shows up. Hey, Thomas, go ahead, put your hands here. And here's the thing, Thomas didn't do that. He dropped on his knees and he said, my Lord and my God. But, but he doubted. That was, that was part of his nature. I mean, uh, Thomas had somewhat of a bleak disposition. So notice, then Thomas, who's called the twin, I mean, remember, they're worried about going and being persecuted, and maybe they would die. So Thomas, the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go with him that we may die with him. Now, this is what I call loyal despair. His love is so strong, he's willing to die for Jesus. His faith is so weak, he knows he's going to. (laughs) Eh, we're going to die. Let's do it. I mean, wow. Now, again, I got to love the part of him, though, that is willing to die for Jesus. Willing to die for the Lord. As we just wrap up our time here, we've been talking about death and all. Would you be willing to die for the Lord? Now, I think for a Christian, we'd say, yeah, I'd be willing to die for the Lord, be willing to die for Jesus. Now, suffice to say, though, most of us here will never do so. Most of us will never be in that point where it's a life or death situation. So we can say it. We say, I'd die for Jesus. So here's the way that we can can do it, though. So you may not die for Jesus, live for Jesus. Oh, there's the challenge. Because it's easy to say, I'll die for Jesus. Okay, you could die for Jesus. Live for him. Live for him. 
Uh, Paul said this in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is going to be all for Christ. For me to live is Christ. And when I die, it's gain. It's gain. Now, here's the thing. That's your choice. Live for Jesus, die is gain. But if you live for something else, it really is not gain. I mean, if you live, I mean, people live for a lot of things. Ask yourself, what do I really live for? What is it? What is it I really live for when it comes down to it? I mean, can you honestly say Jesus is number one? I mean, it's important to get to answer that question in your mind. I mean, because it might be, you know, really, I'm, I'm living, you're young, and I'm, I'm living for that career. Well, to live for that career and die without Christ is to, you, you need to never have it, to lose it. Even if you get it, to lose it. If you live for money and you amass all kinds of money, to die is to lose it. To die is to lose. You're, gonna, it's, you're, not, you're not taking it with you. If you live for any other purpose rather than Christ, be it a comfort or a relationship or a possession, you will have some temporary gain. Yes, there is some temporary gain. But when to die is to lose it all because Jesus said, was it a prophet, a man, if he gains the whole world? What if you got everything you ever wanted? Bill Gates style or whatever. But you lose your own soul? Is it worth it? No. But listen, we're, we're sold a bad sell of goods, you know, from the enemy. In, in John 10.10, 10, we saw it back in chapter 10, in verse 10, Jesus said this, the thief, that's the devil, he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to rip you off, stealing from you, lie to you, say, no, all, all, it's all in pleasure. It's all in money. It's all in the things, you know. But when it comes down to it, do they really satisfy? I mean, he tries to deceive us. What a lie that is. All the goods we amass, there it's nothing. We see that in our kids. You buy your child a toy, and as they play with it for a week or two or a month, and it's in another pile with the other toys that were there months before, months before, and it's piled up. Why aren't you playing with toys? Well, it's bored in a toy, you know. And then we grow up, and you know what we do? We got our own toys, right? But they're just bigger toys. Man, that car is so awesome. If I had that car, it'd be so good. It's got the good car smell. It's awesome. A year later, I hate that car. I hate that car. What a stupid car, right? We do that. We do that about things. Some people do it with relationships. But all the things that we try to find satisfaction in, or we try escapism through drinking or drugs, man, just want to get away from all Then we wake up and we deal with all the effects of that. It doesn't satisfy. Only Christ satisfies. To live is Christ. Because here's what Jesus said in the rest of that verse. He said, this thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. He comes to give abundant life, real life now, and the assurance of eternal life when we pass from this life. Again, we're all going to die one day. That's, that's a fact. Ten out of ten die. We're all dying. And, and we don't like to talk about it, but that's the truth. And, but here's the thing. We can have the assurance of where we're going when we die, when we pass from this life. So my prayer for you is, 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 are you living for Christ? Have you asked Christ in your life? If you haven't, today would be that day. It's an opportunity today. We're going to pray. I wanna get, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Ask Christ in your life. You say, what does that mean? It's just recognizing you're a sinner, being honest to yourself. I'm a sinner. The Bible says we all sin, come short of the glory of God. Acknowledge that. Secondly, the Bible says that we need to believe. We need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead. It says that in Romans 10, 9. We need to place our faith, our trust. And so today, I would ask you to make a commitment to that. Commit to say, yes, I am a sinner. Yes, Jesus Christ is God. And I want to ask him into my life, and I want to live for him. That's what you do. I want to give you that opportunity. It's a sweet opportunity. It's free. All you got to do is ask Jesus and receive him. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Or if maybe you need to return to the Lord, been far from him, not following him, I mean, you're a child of God, but you know Jesus isn't number one. Maybe he's been second or even further in your life. Well, today would be the day to say, I'm going to make Jesus number one. You've just heard Pastor Ron Hint and the radio ministry of Calvary Houston here on Large Than Life. Pastor Ron's currently in the Gospel of John. John is one of the four books in the Bible that describes the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus Christ. 
In his short time here on earth, Jesus changed the world and the entire course of human history through his life, death, and resurrection. Whether you joined us halfway through our program today or you caught just the ending, we'd encourage you to visit the link that provides this message in its entirety and other messages like this one. All you have to do is visit ltlradio.org and click on the teaching archive. Do you feel like you're constantly on the go with no time to slow down? You're not alone. And the good news is we've got you covered. You can listen to more of Pastor Ron's message by downloading our mobile app, which is available on our website, ltlradio.org. Were you aware that Larger Than Life is also in podcast form? All you have to do is subscribe. So don't leave that website without doing that. Are you in the Friendswood, Texas area? Do you have a church you call home? If not, we'd like to invite you to join our community as we worship Jesus together. Service times and directions can be found on our website, ltlradio.org. That's all the time we have for today, but we hope you join us again to hear more great teachings right here on Larger Than Life.